Have you ever wondered how the body generates electricity? Well, want to know more? The shortest answer is the chemical reactions between different atoms and molecules within the body occur, generating electricity, but that's not very interesting. So let's move on to the more detailed answer. To begin with, if you think back to your junior high school science class, you might remember different atoms have different numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Protons being positive, electrons being negative, and neutrons being neutral. Each basic element, like the oxygen you breathe and the sodium and potassium you eat, have certain numbers of protons and electrons that will distinguish them from other elements. Most elements have the same number of electrons as they do protons. This will give it a basic balance between negative and positive charges. Protons reside in the nucleus center of the atom, while electrons rotate around the nucleus. An interesting fact about electrons is that the energy they have is restricted to specific levels levels known as shells. These shells allow for specific spaces between the rotating electron and the center protons, sort of like how planets orbit at different distances away from the sun. Since negatively charged electrons are attracted to positively charged protons, the further away from the center of the atom an electron is, the more loosely the electron is held to the nucleus and the easier it is to knock that electron free of it. Electrons in the outermost shell of an atom, known as the valence shell, are so loosely bound to the nucleus they can break away rather easily. If you get enough energy to break an electron free and cause it to move in a certain direction, the electron in the valence shell of the adjacent atom will flow to that atom because, as we know, in most cases you need an equal electron to proton ratio in an element. These freely flowing electrons are what we are harnessing from the outside power sources. This is what you are referring to as electricity. So this all brings us to the electricity created in the human body. In this case, the energy source creating it is chemical. The energy created by chemicals has to do with the composition of the atoms and the molecules present. All the elements we take into our bodies, like oxygen, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, etc., have a specific electrical charge meaning they have a specific number of electrons and protons. Different chemicals are made up of different molecules. How these molecules are bound together and how they react to other molecules near them is how chemicals create such energy. When we take in our food, the large molecules within it are broken down into smaller molecules and elements by our digestive system. Those smaller molecules and elements can be used by our cells to do work. That process is called cellular respiration. All of those molecules and elements have the potential to create electrical impulses depending on the situations within the specific body systems at the time. Time. For a specific example of this sort of thing in action, one of the most commonly mentioned electrical currents created by the body is our heart rhythm. Our hearts contain a grouping of cells that reside in the upper right portion known as your sinoatrial node, or SA node for short. The cells within the SA nodes, the pacemaker of the heart, contain electrolytes, both inside and outside the cells. Some of the most common electrolytes within the body, as mentioned previously, are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and chloride. Sodium and calcium generally reside outside the SA node cells, and potassium lies within. These specialized cells allow much more sodium to enter the cell than allow for potassium to leave it. The result is a continually growing positive charge. Once that charge reaches a certain point, calcium channels open up in the cell membrane and allow for calcium to enter as well. This makes the interior of the cell extremely positive, known as an action potential. Once that potential reaches a certain point, it has enough power to discharge down the nerves of the heart. Electrolytes crossing cell membranes, creating electrical discharges, is only one of countless ways that the body uses the food we eat to create energy and power to do work. But when you ask how the body creates electricity, the answer is as simple as chemistry. While this might not seem like the same electricity that powers your computer, at its core, well, it really is. The difference is what energy source caused the flow of electrons and how that flow created the reactions that it did. 
And now for some bonus facts. Speaking of living things that generate electricity, let's consider the electric eel. However, the problem we quickly run into is that, well, these don't actually exist. There are, however, electric fish. Eight foot long, 600 volt, mouth breathing, alligator killing fish. On this note, although there are a number of fish that produce an electrical charge, the species that is commonly called the electric eel, E. electricus, is a member of the fish order Osteriophysian. Mistaken for an eel due to its shape and lack of pelvic, caudal, and dorsal fins, E. electricus has a long, up to two meters, cylindrical body and a flat head. Its vital organs are found in the front fifth of its body near the head, while the rest of its long body contains three electric organs. Together, they are filled with nearly 6,000 specialized electrocyte cells that, as the name suggests, produce and store and discharge electricity. The electric organs begin to develop early in the fish's lifetime. The sacs, which produce only a weak electrical charge and are used for echolocation, begin to develop very soon after birth. The other two electrical groups, known as the main and the hunters, produce much higher voltages of around 600 volts and at about 1 amp, so 600 watts for approximately 2 mil. Seconds. Interestingly, although the fish has gills, it takes in most of its oxygen through its highly vascular mouth and therefore often comes to the water's surface to breathe. The fish is also covered with a thick gray to brownish black skin. It is presumed that this tough layer protects it from its own electrical current. As for its uses of electricity, they are threefold. First, there's orientation. While swimming through its murky habitat at night, it's nocturnal, the electric fish orients itself by periodically emitting a weak electrical discharge. Objects around the eel ultimately distort the created electrical field to an extent, making it so that the eel can more or less feel the presence of the object via this discharge. Next up, they use it for hunting, locating prey, getting close, and then emitting a large electrical current. Toothless, the electric fish, eat their prey by swallowing them whole. Not just for stunning prey, their electrical discharge is also handy for defense, with, as mentioned, voltages as high as around 600 volts and about 1 amp for about 2 milliseconds being possible. This is, of course, often emitted when it's attacked. Although experts say the shock is rarely fatal by itself, it can kill some attackers. At the very least, it's a jolting deterrent to most. This all brings us around to how they actually produce electricity. In a nutshell, their electrogenic cells carry a negative charge of about 100 millivolts on the outside of the cell versus the inside. Once a signal to trigger the electrical pulse occurs, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released, secreted through nerves in the cell. Ultimately, this results in ion channels opening up on one side. This all results in sodium ions rushing into the cell and potassium ions exiting on the other side of the cell. Because this occurs on opposite sides of the cell, it ends up creating essentially a tiny battery out of the cell with one side positive and the other side negative. The cells all bunch together, sort of like a long line of batteries stacked together, akin to a bunch of batteries in line in a flashlight. The result is a much greater overall charge that lasts approximately 2 milliseconds or so, as noted. Moving on from there, batteries are another extremely common example of chemical energy being harnessed. You might think that this type of harnessing is a new technological achievement that only modern man has been able to enjoy. But the truth is that chemical batteries have been around since approximately 200 BC. The oldest known of this type was first discovered in 1938 by Wilhelm Koenig just outside of Baghdad, Iraq. Consequently, they are known as Baghdad batteries. They were clay jars that contained a copper cylinder that encased an iron rod. Evidence of an acid was also found within the jars. While researchers and scientists continue to argue over their potential use and origins, what is known is that exact replicas have the power to create approximately 0.8 to 2 volts of electrical current. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We got brand new videos every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out another channel I do called Highlight History. I'm going to link to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.